you're known to be a MMT proponent, have been a prominent advocate of different approaches to economic policies for years. Mm -hmm. What drove you to it? Well, logic in so many words. Um, I, 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 my, whole, my work started, if I look at my academic career, it started in trying to build a mathematical model of Hyman Minsky's financial instability hypothesis. And that uh, was driven by um, knowing what Minsky wished to achieve. I read, I read Minsky's uh, in 1987. And the book I highly recommend other people to read is called Can It Happen Again? Which is a collection of his essays. It's, it's not a full book. Uh, what I read first was a book called John Maynard Keynes. And if you want a really deep explanation of Minsky's theories, that's the one to read. If you want to get through it in an hour uh, by reading a few papers then read, can it happen again? But that was the first uh, John Maynard Keynes, which I read as a, a master's thesis topic, no master's essay, essay from a master's degree for doing my PhD at the University of New South Wales. And that was the first time I'd read a book on critical of capitalism, which I thought made sense because everything I've read beforehand, like for example, if you read Baran and Sweezy, Monopoly Capital, uh, mm -hmm. that talked about capitalism having a tendency to stagnation. Now that didn't make any sense to me. I didn't see stagnation, I saw booms and crashes. And what Minsky said is the fundamental instability of the capitalist economy is upward. The tendency to turn doing well into a speculative boom is the primary weakness of capitalism. And he was dead right. And so, but what he, when he tried to do, um, in, he tried to make a mathematical model of that and he used as a basis of that he used a model by John Hicks, also Paul Samuelson and Alvin Hansen called the multiplier accelerator model. Now I'd already proven as a master's thesis, essay, pardon me, not a thesis, I'd proven that was mathematically un, un, the unsound model. Okay? Mm -hmm. So I knew it was the wrong foundation. So I looked around for an alternative and I used work of a guy called Richard Goodwin and I extended that to include private debt. And then what I simulated out of that is what finally happened which was not just a debt bubble, but also uh, a tendency for income distribution to get worse. Workers got less, bankers got more. So what I ended up doing was simulating what was happening in the real economy before it happened. I published that paper in, I wrote that paper in August of 92. It wasn't published for three years, courtesy of the journal, um, but I wrote it in August of 92. And after that, what we began to see is what neoclassical economists called the great moderation. There was a decline in the volatility of growth rates. Growth, growth uh, didn't grow as much during booms, but didn't fall as much during slumps. Uh, you had falling inflation and you had falling unemployment over time. And that's exactly what my model predicted before you had a crisis. Whereas the neoclassicals looked and thought, oh, wonderful, fantastic. Aren't we doing a great job of managing the economy? Quite, to quote uh, Ben Bernanke, he said, this is a welcome change in the nature of the economy. I was seeing warning signs everywhere. So that was my initial work and that's modeling Minsky. I can, I can actually show that model if you like, if you want to do a, a screen share. Yeah, sure. um, so this is a model of Minsky's financial instability hypothesis done in my the software I've invented called Minsky. Uh, and I just want to show just a, a very quick simulation of what happens. What you've got is a growth. This, this is uh, the basic logic says the, the, number, the amount of machinery you have installed determines output, which determines employment which determines the employment rate, which determines the rate of change of wages, which gives you the wages bill, uh, which you subtract from GDP and, and, and as well as subtracting interest to work out what profit is, which gives you the profit rate, which tells you the investment share, which gives you how much investment occurs, which comes back and gives you the amount of capital. So it's all this a logical structure of a very simple model of a capitalist economy. But what when you simulate it, what you see is it looks like it's heading towards equilibrium. If you look at this pattern here, with mm -hmm. this uh, running the employment rate on the horizontal and the wager share on the vertical, it looks mm -hmm. like you're heading to converging towards an equilibrium. But what you've got over here is a rising level of private debt. And that's a third dimension that's not shown in this particular chart. Mm -hmm. And actually what is going on is this is like a two dimensional slice or a three dimensional object. Mm -hmm. And you've also got a rising amount going to bankers over here and you can just tell it's happening here, a diminishing amount going to workers. So mm -hmm. if, even though the, in this, I've got the capitalists borrowing money to build new factories, uh, but it's the workers who pay with a fall in the wages share. And then after a period of what looks like stability, you start to get increasing volatility and ultimately the system will break down. Mm -hmm. That's a very stylized version of what actually happened in the global economy. So that's mm -hmm. what gave me a, um, 
a, a predecessor, pardon me, is my partner's stuff coming up here, um, gave me a, a, pre, a pre-warning that a crisis is going to happen. And then uh, to extend my capacity to model capitalism, I've, I've, the reason I invented Minsky was there were plenty of programs that already do what Minsky does in terms of that flowchart dynamics I've just shown. I can do that in VizSim, um, Simulink, VenSim, I think, Stella, a whole lot of programs already do it. What I added with Minsky was the capacity to model financial flows using double entry bookkeeping. Mm-hmm. And what I've added here, this is a very simple model, deliberately simple, of a government running a deficit, uh, banks creating credit, and a government sending, selling bonds to finance uh, to, after it's made a deficit, paying interest on the bonds. Uh, this is firms borrowing, firms paying interest on the, on the borrowings they've done, hiring workers, workers consuming and bankers consuming. That's a very, very simple model of the economy. Now we have an obsession in, in mainstream economics with running a surplus. What I've got going on here is actually make sure of that. I've got a, I've got a deficit of minus 1% of GDP, which of mm-hmm. course is a surplus. And when you run it, and this, 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 if you look at mainstream economists, they think running a surplus is a good idea. Okay? So they'll, they'll hedge and say, no, it should be balanced over the long term. But generally speaking, they end up being in favour of surpluses, particularly the deficit hawks, as Stephanie Kelton calls them. If I run this model, I run it for a while, let it continue. You get a reasonable growth going on there, and that looks all fantastic. Why are you getting growth? It's because at the same time as I've got the government running a 1% of GDP surplus, the private sector is running a 5% of GDP deficit by borrowing, non-banks borrowing from banks. Now, Mm -hmm. if I change that and say, well, let's actually just say there's no borrowing from banks, so we don't have any contribution from credit, that's effectively zero there, and continue going, then what you get is the economy plunges. You can see the GDP graph over here heading down for a crash. I've set it up so it only goes for 10 years. Okay, so that's that, that's showing this is now an integrated view of the role of both credit, which is what I've modelled in Minsky overall, and now the government sector. And it comes out confirming, I'll just actually go to an opposite situation now, running a, a, de- a surplus of, of, say, 2.5% of GDP. And if you do that, rather than that causing an economic catastrophe, it causes growth, as you can see from the GDP chart now. And again, I've stopped it at 10 years just for, to save simulation time, because the government running a deficit creates an identical surplus for the private sector. This is the point MMT makes. And uh, I have to say that when I first, um, most of what MMT claimed about government money creation, uh, I was no surprise to me. I know banks create money. Uh, I I, I knew a lot about it, but I'd focused on modeling credit. And when I read Stephanie Kelton's The Deficit Myth, she made the claim there, which is an MMT claim, that the deficit itself creates money. Mm-hmm. Now, when I was asked about it in the past, I'd say, well, the deficit creates money to the extent which the deficit is financed by central bank bond purchases. But she claimed, no, that doesn't matter. I thought, well, I better model this. And, and then this with Minsky, I could do it. So here I've got the deficit running. And what happens is the government is running a, a deficit, which means it increases the reserves of the deficit, uh, which increases the reserves of the banking sector by the deficit, and that money is going to firms. I'm just modelling a simple situation where the government only spends money on firms. It doesn't spend money on workers or bankers here. But that's just a, just, it would be exactly the same result if I included the other um, sectors as recipients as well. And he's right, she's right. If you run a deficit, you create money. You put money in people's bank accounts. If you run a surplus, you take money out of their bank accounts. Now, what about bonds? Well, as you're running, the, because we're talking double entry bookkeeping here, when the, when, the, when the banks record that they've put, a, that the government's put additional money in people's bank accounts, they also record that they've put additional reserves in the assets of the banking sector. So the deficit creates money here and creates excess reserves there. Now, normally banks don't earn any interest, negative or positive, on reserve balances, whereas bonds offer a positive return. So they've got the courtesy of the deficit itself, the deficit creates the additional money in the finance sector that can then be used to buy bonds. So bonds are just an asset swap. They don't actually finance, they don't create the money that's necessary. And if the bonds weren't sold, there'd be no difference to this part of the model. What would change is that without the bonds being sold, the treasury's account of the central bank would become an overdraft account. 
Now, mm-hmm. normally, if you, if you and I have an overdraft account, we're in trouble, okay? Mm-hmm. We're paying a higher interest rate than we would on a normal loan. Uh, we get restrictions on what we can spend. But we don't Banks create come money. Down. <laughs> we don't create money. The government has created money here. And if the Treasury runs up a deficit with the central bank, what does the central bank do? Charge them interest? Who does it pay the interest to? The Treasury. So in that circularity sense, the government can run an indefinite, um, if it wants to, run an indefinite deficit as it, with it showing up as, an, as a, a, an overdraft account at the central bank. Um, but that doesn't have anything like the ramifications that it has for you and me. So the bonds themselves simply mean that the Treasury can keep its deficit, uh, run a deficit while keeping its, its, its um, central bank account positive. And what it's doing notionally and effectively as well, but it's getting down here, it's getting its equities are going negative, minus deficit, minus interest on bonds. And if you look over here and say what's happening, courtesy of the, uh, the, the government running um, this deficit, then mm-hmm. it's adding to the equity of the banking sector through the interest, and it's adding to the equity of the firm sector through the deficit. All the other terms can- cancel out except credit, which we can talk about in a moment. But mm-hmm. what that means is um, the government running a deficit is actually financing the private sector, and mm-hmm. the sum total of the of the debt the government's accumulated is identical to the increase in the equity of the private sector. Mm-hmm. Now, all these things come out of MMT. So. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and like I said, this particular discovery is one that MMT people were already aware of. I'm not an, I'm not a, an act, I'm, not, I'm not a core member of MMT in that sense. But in, in getting this result, I said, well, they're right. And therefore, the whole bond vigilante thing is simply nonsense. Bond vigilantes would be banks that were stupid enough to turn down an offer uh, of, of exchanging money in which they got zero interest for money in which they get 2%. That's not a vigilante. That's an idiot. <laughs> so, you know. That's, that's, that's what um, converted me to MMT. Now, I, ha- have, I have issues with other parts of MMT. So I think their analysis of foreign trade is nonsense. So that's why I became an MMT advocate, but I'm still critical of the foreign trade stuff. Uh, mm-hmm. I didn't want to criticise them at all because I have to you know, take my proverbial hat off to them because they're the first time a non-orthodox, heterodox view of economic policy has become part of mainstream discussion. Mm-hmm. And I didn't want to do anything to, uh, to damage that. But I thought this stuff on foreign trade was nonsense. This is the whole argument that exports are a cost and imports are a benefit. What in particular about it did, did you well, have troubles with? It's, it's naive on too many fronts to, to, to mention. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the, one of the first ones is that uh, it presumes that there's what's called an opportunity cost in economic theory of an export. So if you export you know, an extra Lamborghini from Italy, that's mm-hmm. one less Lamborghini you can use in Italy, and therefore Italy suffers and America get benefits by getting the Lamborghini in, in return for pieces of paper that it's sent over to Italy. Um, in fact, there is no opportunity cost because there's not, uh, in, when you look at the, the cost structure of corporations, they don't face rising marginal cost. Mm-hmm. So most firms operate with large amounts of spare capacity. And if you run an export uh, surplus, if you're exporting more than you're importing, then you are using more of your physical capacity as an economy than the country running a, a deficit. Mm-hmm. And you can invest that surplus. You get money effectively it ends up creating domestic money mm-hmm. uh, for, or forcing the central bank to create more domestic money. And that mm-hmm. means you can invest and grow more rapidly. Mm-hmm. So I, I think the whole argument that exports are a cost, imports are a benefit is simply wrong. And um, but that's minor. I mean, that, that's the, the mm-hmm. 90, 95% of, of MMT is talking about the government money capacity, the fact that running a deficit is a good idea. Uh, it's, it's the, it's the it's deleterious impacts which can occur that are the, the worry, mm-hmm. but the act, in normally a government should run a deficit because that's creating an identical surplus for the private sector. And from my point of view, what that means is the private sector is less likely to go and borrow money and gamble. If you look at the overall accounting, and again, I'll just actually try to point this out rapidly here, uh, I haven't shown all the all the sectors here, but the the deficit that's run by the government ends up being a surplus for the private sector. Whereas mm-hmm. if you look at the private private non banking sector, strictly speaking, if you did an accounting of uh, looking just in terms of assets and liabilities as your claims and other people and other people's claims on you, those claims necessarily sum to zero. Um, now, if you have a banking sector, a banking sector by definition has to have positive equity. The very first thing you do is organising a bank is run up capital 
And then mm. you start with positive equity. And if you get into negative equity because your assets collapse in value or your loans, loans get repaid, you go bankrupt. Mm -hmm. So in general, the banking sector has to be in positive equity. That by definition means the rest of the world relative to the banking sector is in negative equity. Now, a reaction to negative equity, uh, even though it's a necessity of, of, a, of a totally private sector system, uh, nobody likes being in negative equity. So what do you do? Oh, I think I'll go and borrow some money from a bank and gamble on shares or gamble on real estate. And the actual gambling thing drives up the asset prices. So it looks like everything is working. And if you value your assets at the price, the last price the asset actually sold for times how many elements of that are in, out, are in circulation, you get a massive positive equity out of it. You look like you're doing fantastically. Mm -hmm. But of course, then you get 1929 and the whole thing comes crashing down and, and that equity was completely illusory. I, I think, a uh, government running a deficit actually reduces the encouragement for the private sector to speculate. And given the, the, the damage we've done, as we can all see from the stock market bubbles in the 90s and early 2000s and the real estate bubble in the 2000s, that's just damaging. It doesn't produce anything. It just gives you an overlevered, um, um, unproductive economy. But is, is there a problem of uh, allocation of capital when, when you, you know, enhance the public public spending? Um, I think what the, with, with the enhanced public sector spending, what you've got is more cash in people's hands. And and like I, I would, I'm, I'm no fan of bureaucrats deciding how to spend money. I've spent enough time in the academic sector to have my fill of bureaucrats almost at the stage I had my fill of bankers. Um, so I'm critical of that. But things like, you know, if free public education is a very good way for run, to run a deficit. Uh, you know, you, you have to have a military and a police force. You don't want to charge for them. So those, those, and you don't want them to be paid either by money. You know, you don't want the mafia being your police force. So there are all elements like that that means that there's ways in which there, there'd be general public services that the public sector should support, supply and finance without taxing back because the taxation actually destroys the money. So there's there's... Uh, and then if you get to put money in people's hands and they can decide what to do with it. Mm. And that's when you, when you look at the 50s and 60s, uh, the government in America was generally speaking running a deficit. The level of private debt was low. The turnover of existing money, the velocity of money was quite high. It's mm. plunged ever since because people are now more and more in debt. Uh, they have gone from when, when they're going to be in, the, in what they call the golden age of capitalism between you know, 50, 50 and, and, six, and 73. Um, the rate of turnover of money was about two. Now it's about one. And one, I think one of the reasons for that is people having so much more debt are cautious about spending, but being cautious about spending, there's less GDP. Yeah, and therefore are we in the Ricardian yeah. equivalents? No, that's bullshit. Ricardian equivalence is total crap. Uh, that's produced by uh, one, of the, one of the, I think the world's worst economists, Robert Barrow. And that Ricardian equivalence was something he used to explain why governments shouldn't run a deficit at all, ever. Because mm -hmm. um, he said, if a government runs a deficit through Ricardian equivalence, that means we know an identical surplus in net present value terms is necessary sometime in the far future. Uh, so what that means is you, if the government runs a deficit, the private sector responds by saving precisely as much, and therefore there's no impact. That's Ricardian equivalence. Mm -hmm. Now, when he, he and in the sort of, garbage that goes on as a debate in neoclassical economics is really getting me angry these days. It was stupid enough having to put up with it when I was a professor of economics, but seeing the state we're getting into the global economy now, I have no time for their stupid how many angels can dance in the head of a pin debates. But if you look at that particular head of a pin debate, uh, some slightly more sensible neoclassical economist than Robert Barrow, and there's plenty of them because he's, he's, he's a, in my opinion, a fool, uh, a politically motivated fool, um, they said, said to him, well, what if people don't expect the taxes that are going to happen to be levied until after they die? Wouldn't that mean that they would therefore spend more uh, given the deficit and therefore there'd be a stimulus from this? They said, oh, that argument fails if current generations are giving money to future generations out of altruism. <laughs> you know, here's a neoclassical economist all about self-interest and stuff that using altruism as a way of defending neoclassical economics. Uh, it's, it's, I mean, it, 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 I'd li like one of these days, I wish I had met Robert Solow, who's, even though he played a major role in building this neoclassical stuff, 
he's become more and more cynical about how it's being employed over time. And he made the point that if, if you see, when you talk to people who come up with this nonsense, and he was thinking particularly of, of Robert Lucas and Thomas Sargent, he said if they love nothing more than to sit down and start discussing technical details of vector order regressions and stuff like this and, you know, and, 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 and uh, perfect foresight expectations, yada, yada, yada. And he said, if you start discussing this stuff with them, you've lost the argument straight away. He said, you should treat them as if a person sits down on a park bench next to you and says he's Napoleon Bonaparte. He said, now the last thing you want to do if somebody says that is start discussing battle tactics in the Battle of Austerlitz. He said, <laughs> you simply laugh at them. And that's what Robert, Bar Robert, uh, Robert Solo said he does to, Tom, to, to uh, Sargent and Lucas these days. And anybody comes up with this garbage, it's just crap. We shouldn't take it seriously. And the fact that it got published is a reason to shut down the journals that published it because they simply can't tell bullshit from sensible argument. 